Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Thank you for your time and welcome to today's session, Top Safety Challenges During Occupied Healthcare Renovations. I'm Mike Losey. Uh, I'm head of marketing with Stark Systems and I'll be your moderator for today. A couple quick housekeeping items. We will absolutely save time for questions uh, at the end of the session. Definitely wanna hear from you guys and have give you a chance to talk to our panelists. Um, so please submit those in the Q&A box uh, in Zoom here on your screen. We're also recording the session and we'll make it available to you guys uh, with the email you registered uh, for the event. So I wanted to offer a little bit of context real quickly here um, on screen. Um, today's topic was kind of inspired uh, by our customers. Um, we've got a great cross section of operations directors and directors of engineering, as well as healthcare contractors. And this spring, we were really interested in understanding a little bit more about some of the top challenges they experience for larger renovations in a hospital setting. We added a bit of a spin and asked separately which challenges emerge during a planning phase compared to at project start. So sort of two different phases of, of when you're getting into to work. When we compiled, it was interesting to see a fairly large gap uh, like what you're seeing on screen. So basically the top areas identified, uh, the customers responding said, you know, of course, patient and staff safety um, are paramount. We plan for it, we train for it. Um, and, you know, it certainly comes up at project start, uh, but as compared to things like dust and ventilation and ICRA management, uh, not so much the risk assessment side of it, but sort of how do you adhere to sort of risks identified, uh, noise, were things that emerged that, you know, once you get into the project, um, even if you plan for, um, seem to be bigger, either surprises or, or less accounted for. So that was sort of the inspiration. Uh, we have a, are fortunate to have um, very passionate customers and industry partners who also wanted to uh, talk through the topic. And that's what we've put together for you here today. You're going to meet our panelists shortly, uh, but you're going to hear from them very directly as practitioners themselves. You know, how do they think about some of the best practices for uh, ICRA planning and more so the adherence to ICRA once uh, it's been uh, put in place? The importance of documentation, uh, how to plan for human behavior and space use, uh, and its importance. Um, um, you know, early on. The importance of sort of a really a mindset shift and Josh is gonna jump in and talk about um, sort of avoiding box che checking as it relates to fire codes and life safety measures. And finally, we'll, we'll definitely wanna end and share a perspective on, you know, some of the more recent advancements uh, in containment, um, especially when you think about designing with safety in mind and Bill Cooper from Stark's gonna to speak to that. So let's meet our panelists. Paul, if you could kick us off and introduce yourself briefly and we'll get right into it. Yes, hello everybody. My name is Paul Gutman. I'm a senior project manager for University of Michigan Health. Janet? Hi, I'm Janet Haas. I'm the principal conduct, uh, consulting epidemiologist at Innovative Infection Prevention. Um, I've had over 20 years experience in hospital and healthcare infection prevention. I'm a past president of APIC and one of the editors of the American Journal of Infection Control. Josh? Hey everyone, uh, Josh Brackett. I'm a fire protection engineer uh, and the system regulatory director at Banner Health. Um, and I also am co-founder of Legacy FM, a company that focuses on um, healthcare facilities, education and training. Happy to be here. Bill? I'm Bill Cooper. I'm the Senior Vice President of Sales for Stark Systems. Stark is a company based in Brunswick, Maine that offers uh, three innovative solutions, uh, the providing temporary containment and uh, with one goal in mind, and that's to eliminate the disruption of renovation and improve isolation. Thanks, guys. Paul, why don't you get us going? Yes. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for attending. Again, my name is Paul Gutman. Uh, I work for University of Michigan Health, and I oversee our in-house construction team. Um, about 100% of what we do is uh, occupied health setting. Um, my background is in construction. I've been in construction for over 45 years, and I have over 25 years of hospital construction experience. Uh, just a little bit about uh, the, the University of Michigan Health System. Uh, the U of, U of M Health System is the first hospital that was owned and operated by a university. We've got over 30,000 employees, over 8 million square feet of space. Uh, we operate three hospitals. 
uh, over 1,000 beds, 82 ORs, over 54,000 surgeries each year, and over 100,000 ER visits. And uh, just recently, we broke ground for a new adult patient inpatient hospital that will add another 700,000 square feet of space, another 264 beds, and uh, 23 surgical and interventional radiology suites. Next slide. Oh, well, let's stick on this slide. Um, the first common challenge I'd like to talk about is that uh, organizations overlook taking a proactive, collaborative approach to ICRA. Um, as we all know, immune compromised patients can be anywhere. They can be in adjacent space to the construction site. They can be on the floor above. They can be on the floor below. Or if, you're, if you have a path of travel that the electricians or plumbers have to go to get from your job site to either electrical closets or communication closets, uh, to perform mechanical and electrical uh, tie-ins, you can encounter immune compromised patients. Many times uh, the design professionals do not meet with epidemiologists who have a better understanding of the potential risk. Uh, the outcome of poor planning are job shutdowns, uh, which nobody likes to see, delays in the construction project, and increased cost to both the contractor as well as the institution that uh, has the loss of the use of space and the associated revenue, and more importantly, the patient treatment. Let's go to the next slide, please. At Michigan Medicine, we proactively plan our ICRA. Uh, we begin with our policy standards for infection prevention. Um, and then at the start of a project, we meet as a team. Uh, we do this at the, uh, at the schematic design phase of a project. We also meet at the 25% construction documents, the 50% construction documents, as well as the 95% construction documents to make sure that uh, what we're building is, uh, um, is not only the solution that the customer wants, but is also the solution that's gonna be designed with safety in mind. Uh, if you wait until the construction kickoff to plan your ICRA, uh, it's, it's too late in the process. Um, the teams that we have include uh, both people from the construction team, the safety inspectors, our design professionals, our infection control professionals, uh, infection prevention professionals, and also the occupants and sta stakeholders. Next slide, please. During construction, our supervisors communicate our ICRA plans to our field personnel. Uh, they also perform daily reviews of our infection control measures and uh, document it on a checklist that's posted at the entrances to our sites. Uh, and whenever we perform work outside of our work areas, we always use HEPA cards. Next slide, please. Our second major challenge is improper temporary wall documentation. If our temporary walls are constructed improperly, or if your temporary walls are constructed improperly, it has a major impact on your project. Uh, contractors, especially ones that aren't familiar with healthcare construction, awfully don't know about or they look, overlook the requirements for fire rated walls. And Josh will get into this uh, later on in the presentation. Um, they plan on using traditional construction measures like this queen with zippers, um, but NFPA requires a one hour wall between construction and occupied space. In addition to the, the requirement of the construction of the wall, you also must construct them where you're maintaining a minimum corridor width. If the walls don't meet the requirements, they must be torn down and reconstructed. And again, this adds time and cost to a project. Next slide, please. Um, some very important advice for owners. Please, please, please have your architects properly document temporary walls. I really can't emphasize this point enough. 
you know, have, you're paying a design professional, you know, have them design the temporary walls. It's not just a couple of dotted lines on a blueprint saying, put up temporary walls here. Uh, have them include a UL rating if it's required. And, uh, and uh, as an owner, include this design requirement in your organization's policy standards for infection prevention during construction. Um, and also, if you have the opportunity, require architects to specify or include pre-engineered walls as an alternative to conventional construction. Next slide, please. Um, this is actually a, a blow up of uh, one of our construction project uh, documents uh, where it shows the, uh, a properly documented wall. Um, the nice thing about this is this was an entrance into an OR. Um, it documented an eight foot corridor width as a minimum. It, uh, it required it to be one hour rated construction. Uh, it had a, a requirement for a C labeled hollow metal door and frame. And uh, it also specified that the room be sealed and monitored for negative air pressure. With that, I'd like to reintroduce Janet Haas to review the next challenges we face while working in occupied healthcare facilities. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks again. And we'll jump right in with the next slide. So um, I appreciate what uh, Paul just told us about the pre-planning. And one of the things to be mindful of is not planning for human behavior and make sure that you do plan for human behavior because overlooking this can lead to a lot of problems with shortcuts, um, time constraints, et cetera. As you see in the picture here, there's somebody who took the time to bring a movable containment cart to the area and then chose to be pulling cable through without uh, using it. And in addition to convenience and habits, uh, this also speaks to the culture and, um, and the fact that people feel like it's okay to do this. It happens that this was in a hallway in a non-occupied area, but um, this gentleman just took somebody's word that he didn't need to use this, this containment device and there was nothing official about any of that. Okay, next. So if you wanna anticipate you have to make it easiest to do the right thing uh, rather than to make, uh, make it more convenient to do a workaround. Plan for the work area that you're working in to be uh, not too hot, not too cold. Um, have the things that the work, workers will need, and this is both for during construction and also for during the final use of the area to do things uh, easily and comfortably. Coordinate movement and of course, monitoring frequently is always important. Next slide. So speaking of easy choices, um, if I had a nickel for every plastic wall that I saw like this with the zippers not, not uh, fully zipped, uh, I'd be a rich person. Um, so something that seems easy in the design phase of the, of the protection is not necessarily easy to carry out repeated times every single day. Uh, the, the picture on the right of drywall is better because it has a door and people are used to going in and out and closing a door and they can keep that, that area closed. But you have to keep in mind the caveats of enclosing and protecting the area while the drywall is being constructed and the time and materials associated with that, as well as uh, when you're done with the project, putting up additional barriers to be able to take down drywall walls. Next. You have to anticipate and troubleshoot for the things that might go on during construction, such as storage of materials. Um, it can't be out of sight, out of mind because they can be a way to bring dust or water um, into the hospital and into the construction site within the hospital. Uh, if they're not properly stored in an area that prevents them from, from contamination with either of these things. Um, you have to think about the coordination of movement, path, 
pathways that must be followed and everybody has to be um, aware of those. Times, particularly that debris or materials will be moved through the hospital outside of the construction area. Coordinate the use of the elevators, make sure that the elevators are cleaned after they're used for construction um, requirements and before they're put back into use for say patient transport or food transport. And this will probably require some concierging of the process to make sure that it works well and to uh, troubleshoot or problem solve uh, when kinks are identified. Next, please. The team that needs to work in the area really needs to be educated. And this can be done a number of ways. Oftentimes there's some kind of orientation for contractors that uh, is required before a project starts. And that's good. And um, we, we all do that, but it may not be enough. And adults learn best with just-in-time education. And the picture that you see here is um, after an orientation to construction with a number of healthcare workers, construction workers, in a, in a hospital setting, everybody learned about aspergillus and the risks associated with dust and everybody nodded their head and indicated that they understood. And then everybody got up and left. And this is the chair that was left behind. And there's a perfect dust butt print of somebody's pants on the chair. So that means that that worker walked all the way through the hospital from the work site to get to this class nodded his head, left, and had that much dust on his clothing. So when you have a moment like that, you have to find the person and say, hey, did you realize this is what this looks like? And that means you've got all this dust that could be you know, shedding off of you as you move through the hospital and it's just not safe for our patients. So keeping in mind, if you have that uh, moment where you can see so obviously something that people may understand theoretically and not really recognize that they're part of the problem. And of course you need to have some accountability if you have people with repeated breaches. So educate once or twice, but beyond that you have to have some way to hold people accountable because it really is about the safety of the patients, staff and visitors in and around the space of the hospital that needs to be paramount. Next. Okay, so we've talked about ICRA, but there is a term of safety risk assessment. And I'm wondering who's familiar with those and how often those are done in your facility. So we're gonna launch a little poll and let us know what you think. If you could launch the poll, please. Okay, have you had a chance to vote? We'll see if we can uh, see how it looks and give you a look at how things are done. Oh, this is excellent. So most people are doing these at least for major projects, if not always. Um, and the people who are unsure have some work to do to find out what's, what's going on and the never people listen up because um, this is something for you for sure to take, take home. Okay, so next slide. So before construction, there is the safety risk assessment. And that safety risk assessment is concerned with the design of the space to be safe for the program of healthcare that you're having. And you can see um, all, the, all the things that are taken into consideration. Medication safety, infection prevention, fall prevention, suicide risk, fire safety, and patient and family satisfaction. And this safety risk assessment, regardless if you call it part of the ICRA or you call it its own thing, the content really should be in there prior to the start of construction 
and it should include the users of that space who really know what the pain points are in their current space or what their goals are for their um, program, as well as ancillary services that are involved, pharmacy, facilities, and environmental services, um, infection prevention, of course, that's my, my bias, but, um, and anybody else, maybe physical therapy is using that space. You really have to think about and ask the users who else is interfacing with them and who's using that space. And with that group, you can best decide um, along with the designers, what's important to keep a safe program before anything else gets started. Next, please. And this can prevent the problems of not appropriately planning for use of the space. So the right design, it will include adequate storage, cleanable finishes, it will promote safety, comfort, and regulatory compliance. And I like to say that um, great designers, facilities engineers, and contractors look beyond the plan and anticipate possible problems with the finished area. And the picture here shows um, isolation gowns and some Clorox wipes. So presumably the patient in this room is on isolation and there's no good place to put the isolation uh, equipment. So there it is sitting on top of a dirty linen hamper. <clears throat> and we all should know that you need to have a three foot separation between clean and dirty. So this clearly doesn't meet regulatory requirements and just doesn't make sense. And it's really a, a, an example of a failed design, a design that failed to take into account all of the uses for this space. Next, please. And then thinking about repetitive tasks, you can see on the left, there's for some reason a linen hamper that fits under a shelf that doesn't allow the hamper to open up when you step on the foot pedal. You have to move the hamper physically before you can do that. While on the right, you can see that it's, it's um, the detail was considered and the person that's using that linen hamper can leave it in place and open it and put the linen in. This is really important for things that people are doing every single day over and over to encourage it to be easier to do the right thing and not um, do it some other way, throwing the linen on the floor, et cetera. Next, please. And so this is just very brief, but keeping this in mind, you wanna design for your regulatory scrutiny and patient satisfaction. And you can see hopefully that the, the pictures on the left include areas that are not gonna pass, uh, pass muster. You've got clutter in hallways, clean equipment covered in a patient area, where on the right you can see a clean environment with the equipment that's needed and um, the patient being able to do their thing in the bed. And that's what you wanna go for. Next, please. So simple ways to be aware of space use and prepared for that is to conduct that safety risk assessment as well as the ICRA that's gonna really focus on how to keep things safe during construction. Know when and how something should occur both during construction and in the use of the space. If you see something, say something. Um, communicate with the team if you see that there's something either in the design that should be mitigated before the construction starts or during construction uh, if it's gonna pose a risk to patients, staff, or visitors. So thank you. And with that, I will pass it on to Josh. Hi everyone. Um, as I introduced, I'm, I'm Josh Braggett. I recently switched jobs. So part of my slides will be focused on uh, my experience and, and history at my previous uh, healthcare system. Um, and uh, but now I'm at, I'm at Banner Health doing a very similar role um, and already learned some experiences uh, there that we're going to be able to share as well. Next slide. So I want to start, uh, take a step back and remind everybody, you know, it's so easy to forget the why. We've done a wonderful job in healthcare of, um, of preventing fires, and we haven't had a, a large ho hospital fire uh, in the United States in more than two decades. Uh, and, 
But because of those kind of things, it's easy, it's easy for us to forget um, why fire codes exist, right? So uh, the picture here is actually of the fire that um, I claim actually is why I went into fire protection engineering and why uh, I think it's so prevalent from a, a codes perspective. Um, that fire happened in 1911. Uh, it's the Ash Building in New York, and it's known as the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. Um, and what's unique about this fire uh, is particularly that, that um, unfortunately, many people lost their lives, um, and there were locked exits. The fire department ladders weren't high enough to reach. Uh, the list really goes on. But what's, what's critical about this fire and why it's so important to remember and to reflect on history is that as... Um, as a direct result of this fire, uh, the NFPA Safety to Life Committee was formed um, in 1913. So two years later, it took two years, but in 1913, NFPA formed the Safety to Life Committee, which we now know as the Life Safety Code, right? So, um, and I, I say that because it, I think it's important to remember that we get into this, a lot of people get into this box checking methodology. Um, of it's not going to happen to me, you know, uh, I'm going to, I'm ready to go home. It's the end of the day. Uh, I need to do my, my daily rounding uh, for my projects and um, everything's fine, right? So, and that's, we can't have that mentality. You know, we just can't because um, as, a, as unfortunate as it, or as fortunate as we have been over the last two decades, um, at some point, something's going to happen. Right. If we don't, if we're not constantly on guard. Um, so there are things that I think we do as an industry that we need to rethink. Um, right now, I see on a lot of construction projects, uh, smoke detectors or fire alarm devices or water flow switches or uh, are removed um, because it's inconvenient. You know, the smoke detectors uh, get get dusty and they they trip and there's false alarms and those false alarms lead to us not trusting the system. Right. Well, there, there are ways of handling that and there are ways to do it where you cover the smoke detectors during the day when somebody's there because we're not concerned, we're not as concerned about the fire when somebody's there. We have personnel then to manage it, you know, but at nighttime when nobody's there, then that early detection of smoke uh, can, can literally mean, you know, the difference of evacuating uh, smoke compartments or evacuating floors of hospitals, right? Um, so. It, there's, like I said, there's a very low chance that we're going to have a fire in a hospital. We've built hospitals to be non-combustible construction. Uh, we do a lot by breaking them up into compartments. But when there is one, those risks are so high and, and time seconds is everything. Next slide. Um, so during the pre-planning, I think we, we as an industry can do a better job on focusing on life safety. Um, you know, I like to talk about uh, firewalls, <laughs> which is a great example. Um, and Bill's going to talk more about that. Uh, but, you know, it, it's, um, there are many different ways to build a firewall. Um, and if you have, I've seen, I've seen this actually on uh, numerous occasions, you can have somebody on one side uh, building a firewall one way, and then somebody on another side building it a different way. Uh, and the thing is, is that they're UL listed for a reason. They're UL assemblies uh, for a reason. Um, and screwing the heads in uh, to the sheetrock too, too deep um, or not um, having the gaps uh, or the when the sheetrock, you have to have it, um, have the sheetrock, um, the, the, the butts can't align on, the, the, on both sides of the, the one hour wall. Right, so they 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 are built this way for a reason, um, and I think we as an industry really need to to put a heavier focus on life safety during construction because what what um, Paul alluded to earlier, right, that we've got to have these one hour walls uh, between the occupied space and construction because the last thing that we want is if there is a fire in our construction area for it to spread to an occupied area where we've got patients. Um, and um, having that focus during the pre-planning of 
how are, is my contract team, my design team, how are we focusing on life safety? Um, what are we going to do? How are we going to transition it to operations, right? Um, how are we going to close off in, uh, the, every night the, um, any penetrations that, that have um, happened throughout the day? Um, thinking through uh, from an asset tag perspective and inventory, I think um, I've seen this a lot on construction projects as well. I'm sure a lot of you have of, of the uh, assets, inventory schedules, procedures, it all tying into operations. Uh, too many times it just gets dumped on somebody's desk and um, then it has to be built out. There's no reason with the technology that we have nowadays that that we can't do a better job transitioning that to the technicians that have to maintain that building, right? That have to maintain those pieces of life safety equipment that have to keep that inventory. I think everybody on the call, if you've ever had a, an accrediting organization survey um, and uh, then you have to answer for your inventory of, of fire alarm devices. Well, if you're not tracking that inventory based on construction, uh, then that's one of the easiest ways that your inventory gets messed up. Right. So that's something we can really improve as an industry and work together from a design and construction perspective and transitioning that to facilities operations. Um, and then I think it's really important to incorporate the life safety components into the existing life safety, safety drawings. Right? Not Most of our hospitals are built over time. We add additions. We add, uh, we, we add um, wings and areas, and, and those codes have changed for a reason, we, we continue to progress the codes uh, and adapt the codes to what to lessons learned from the past and things and data driven decisions uh, that um, we're moving forward with in the industry. And identifying those really helps helps you to, to understand um, that the life safety drawings are a living document. They are not something that is a, a static in time uh, of of when, what methods were used and how it was built back then. Next slide. And during construction, I already, I alluded to this a little bit, but um, the, you know, make sure, main, making sure that your barriers are continuously maintained. Um, I, I tell people, anybody who knows me knows that I don't worry so much about fire, right? Uh, sprinkler systems are designed to contain fire, right? What I worry about is smoke. In our hospitals, smoke, one penetration in, in a wall uh, you know, you can fill a room in seconds sometimes, the, an adjacent room. Um, if there's, it depends on the penetration, right? So smoke migrates so much faster than, than what people realize. Smoke is the primary cause of death um, in a fire. It's not actually the flames and the heat. Um, it's, it's asphyxiation of oxygen. And um, understanding that and knowing that and, and having that critical focus on it of, of at the end of the day, I know, I know we're tired and I know we want to go home, but um, it's not worth that risk, right? So uh, if you do see somebody um, that's not following the code, having that, what Janet was saying, the just-in-time training, educating them on it, reminding them, here's the reason that we do these things. You know, we don't want to be, uh, we don't want to be that, that hospital that did experience a fire, right? Um, so, and I, I strongly consider, I, I strongly recommend considering keeping your life safety systems in place. Yes, it's inconvenient. It can be, all right? But uh, yes, it can cause false alarms if it's not maintained properly. Uh, but making sure that you have your sprinkler systems, um, turn them up right um, and, and put, them, put them up at the deck while you're doing construction, keeping that system live at the end of every day, taking it down during the day, but then putting it back live at night. These little things really can, in the event of a true fire emergency, make a huge difference. Um, and then uh, something that I really, I really like doing is personalizing uh, the space, right? So because of um, how our human brains are wired, it is hard for us to recognize uh, the tra tragedies when they occur from a mass perspective. So when you, when you think of, um, when you are able to personalize a story and say, you know, this is um, Sophia's, Sophia is, uh, the charge nurse, and this is her team outside of the construction area. So Sophia goes home every day, right, to a family just like us. Sophia is taking care of these patients, right? So you don't have to, you don't have to do 
break any HIPAA violations or anything, but reminding your team of that, posting that, talking about it, reminding them that these are people, right? So um, next slide, please. And uh, then when you're doing construction, um, you have to hold people accountable, like, like uh, Janet and Paula both said. We've got to hold people accountable to the rules because that's, that's the whole purpose. So when I was at Baptist Health, we actually did an above ceiling permit policy. Um, and in that policy, we uh, put teeth in it. Um, and this is something that I'm already uh, looking at, already in discussion with um, at, at Banner from uh, our multi multidisciplinary team there of how do we make it accountable? How do we make it have teeth where uh, people know that you're serious? So what, what this policy specifically said was that uh, it's both for internal and external uh, employees. Internal follows um, standard progressive discipline, but external, uh, any, any contractors, any vendors that would come in that didn't follow our policy had a three strike offense. And that, offense, that was, um, First, it's you're, you get a, just a slap on the wrist. I send an email. I let, let your uh, supervisor know that you didn't follow our policy. Um, and second offense is you're kicked off site for three days. And then the third offense is having your badge permanently revoked. Um, and, you know, I, there, I've had some criticism uh, on this, but it, it worked. You know, there were, there were two individuals that we had to permanently revoke their badge um, because they weren't taking it seriously. And... Uh, but that, again, it goes back to, you've got to, you've got to set those, those standards and hold people accountable to them. Otherwise, um, if you're not leading by example and, and enforcing the policies that you guys put in place, then, uh, nobody else is going to. Okay. So, um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bill. Thank you, Josh. As I mentioned during introductions, I am the Senior Vice President for Stark Systems. Stark is a leader in temporary containment, whether that is containment for construction, renovation, or infection control. In my section of today's webinar, I'd like to review problems with traditional methods, show you some pictures and share some stories with alternate uh, solutions, walk you through the, uh, the Stark design, uh, which is uh, built with safety in mind, show you our three product line, and then uh, give you some uh, uh, pictures of the, uh, the product actually in use. Mike, next slide. So as you've heard from our panelists, uh, safety and cleanliness are really key in keeping the workplace safe, not just for the workers on the job site, but for the patients, the medical staff and the visitors to the facility. Choosing the right containment methods can keep your job site safe while giving your patients, employees, staff, and visitors a level of comfort knowing that they are also safe and protected. Next slide. The first picture you see on the left, you have two top contractors working side by side in the same hospital. You can see the difference in the containment options. And I'm sure you can imagine which area of the hospital you'd want to be uh, getting your, your care in. The second picture on the right is a less structurally sound alternative where the wall actually fell down. When choosing a modular temporary containment solution, you have to account for the entire use case. Yes, you need to consider ICRA requirements, dust contamination, and sound attenuation, but you also need to make sure the solution can stand up to the rigors inside and outside of your job site, be it a worker bringing materials into your job site or a hospital bed coming down the hallway. Next slide. So I'd like to introduce the three lines or product solutions that Stark offers. Light barrier is a durable lightweight option when sound attenuation is not a concern for your job site. Real wall, so named because it looks and acts like a real wall, is our original product line. Fire block wall is the industry's first one hour fire rated temporary reusable barrier. And with all three product solutions, you get easy and fast installation, superior durability, and that leads to ongoing reusability and ultimately cost savings a great appearance either inside or outside of the job site. All three exceed healthcare standards and you get best in class customer service. 
Our products were designed for sensitive environments and ICRA, whether it was the gasket choices on the top and bottom of our panels, the tongue and groove connections between the panels that afford type, tight air type connections. They're engineered in it with integrated negative air components from the start. And that's all to achieve the best possible airflow monitoring and management on your site. They're also designed with the contractor in mind too. They install fast and minimize disruption for the occupied areas. You avoid introducing dust and debris common to drywall. Drywall actually has contaminants that can be dangerous. And if containment is done in one hour with a temporary solution instead of three days, that's less disruption to patients and staff. Next slide, Mike. I mentioned the gaskets on the top and bottom of all of our panels that allow you to create an airtight seal on the floor and the ceiling, but there is a lift and drop connection with all three of our product options that make the wall airtight and virtually foolproof. There's no need for tape, an extra plastic barrier, or anything else. Lift, drop, and move on to the next panel. While it makes Installation easy, the connection also affords the walls a strength and stability you don't see with core plast or plastic sheeting. Keeping your job site compliant with negative air is simple with Stark's integrated design. There's no need to run power cables around or through tight seals, and there's no need to tape a core plast panel in place for ventilation. The model agnostic pressure monitor bracket allows the end user to use the manometer they already have. The doors that the Stark system offers are really a differentiator in the marketplace. They're durable and rugged. Our hinged swing door can open in or out and at the job site can be hinged on the left or the right. Our sliding door is self-closing, so you can open, enter, and have the door closed behind you. This is ideal for when clearance in hallways is at a premium. We offer a number of door handle options, including electronic keypad for ensuring safety and access control. With 42 and 54 inch openings, the larger openings for equipment and common hospital bed sizes are perfect for the healthcare facility. And the adjustable threshold and sweep makes maintaining an airtight seal easy. In addition to the safety elements, the walls look great. We often hear when the job site is clean, it lowers stress levels for patients and facilitates an environment of healing. It's interesting to note that we've actually had uh, ICRA personnel at facilities walk past our walls and not even realize that they were temporary. During much of the pandemic, there was a large call for anti-rooms. With the airtight seal Stark provides, our products are a natural fit for this need. The freestanding airtight anti-room can be deployed almost anywhere and set up in no time. Our system can also include a telescoping ceiling if the existing ceiling isn't flat or is high like in a lobby or a foyer. And probably one of our most uh, innovative uses that we saw during the pandemic came from one of our customers who wanted to remove the curtain partitions in their ER. They replaced those partitions with Stark real wall, complete with the auto closing sliding doors and glass panels. During the pandemic, it was key to isolate the patients as they came into the ER to know how to triage them. Ultimately, they kept the design as it provided their patients with a safe and more private environment. I'd like to recap what we've talked about today. You, you had Paul start off talking about the collaboration between teams and a proactive approach to ICRA being key to keeping your job site safe and keeping everything on task. Proper temporary wall design and plan documentation is also key. I believe the exact quote was it needed to be more than just a line on a blueprint. So knowing where the wall is going, the purpose it's going to serve and the people in the area that are working are all key to making sure that you design an effective solution. 
Janet spoke to the prioritization of dust containment. And I do have to say, I smirk a little every time I see that picture of the seat uh, with the dust imprint. The planning for space use and human behavior during and after the construction is also key. Knowing how the people are going to use the area, be it the construction workers on site or the healthcare workers who are seeing to the patients. Josh spoke to understanding the why and the who behind fire codes and all the safety requirements. And then Stark spoke to the temporary containment solutions with a higher standard now driven by our customer feedback. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Mike and see if we can take on some of the questions and answers. Guys, thank you so much. I really appreciate your perspective and your time. Um, we do have questions coming in. Uh, just give me a, a minute here and I wanna pull a few of those up. A few have been answered um, while the session was going on. I might repeat them just so that the broader audience can hear them if you didn't see it. Um, but let's start with um, Janet. I think you one you answered, um, is the PICRA the same as the SRA? Can you speak to that a little bit for the full audience? Sure. So yes, the answer is that there was an ICRA and PICRA, and the dif difference was that the PICRA was the pre-construction risk assessment, and it spoke to the ultimate use of the space. But I think that it focused more on the physical space rather than the program elements, such as medication safety, um, suicide risk mitigation, uh, and, and so we've changed it to the safety risk, not we, but um, it has been changed that safety risk assessment to align better with program elements um, and then plan for those in the physical design of the space. Thanks so much. Hey, uh, Josh, I think this is a, a good one for you and I might put a few questions together here. Uh, Tim asked what NF, uh, actually I think this was asked during Paul's session, but um, what NFPA code are you referencing for one hour walls during construction? Uh, similarly, uh, in the same vein, maybe you can just give a full rundown of, you know, which codes you think are most relevant. Uh, and with, with regards to one hour temp barrier requirement, can you speak to sprinklers? My understanding is if fire protection is maintained, uh, temp barrier does not need to be rated in FPA 2241. So Josh, can you give us a lay of the land um, and sort of how you think about uh, the various codes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, yeah, I put it in the, in there that, so the NFPA 241 comes from uh, chapter 18 and 19 of, of NFPA 101 um, following 2012 edition. Um, and it's uh, 18, 19, uh, 7.9.2, okay? So, and really where that points us is, is to, to 241, which is safeguarding uh, during construction. In 241, um, Section 8.6.2 is where you talk about your temporary walls. And there are a few options there. It says that you have to maintain uh, integrity of separation between occupied spaces and uh, construction spaces um, for one hour, unless you have your construction area with a live sprinkler system that meets NFPA 13 requirements, right? So where we really run into issues there um, is that a lot of the time when we're going in and demoing um, a construction space for a renovation, for example, then, or building a new building that isn't fully sprinklered yet, um, uh, then you have, you have to turn all of the heads um, upright and you have to get them within, um, to, up to the deck. Uh, and sometimes, depending on the depth of the beams and things like that, you may have to add. So there's, there's a, there is work to be done um, one way or the other, right? So, uh, and I, I think uh, one of the questions was um, about um, the, uh, like, how do you do that for active areas above ceiling and things like that? And so, so maybe you guys will talk about that too. But the, it, the important thing is that there, there's the two options for you to consider. And each project um, may have pros and cons based on the existing conditions if it's a, if it's if you're renovating that, that area, right? So it's looking at beforehand, this pre-planning stage that we're talking about before, this pre-planning of which is the better option for the given scenario. And sometimes, even though it's not required by code, depending on the area, you may want to do both, right? So, 
if I'm if I'm doing construction directly next to a NICU, I'm going to err on the side of caution. Great, thanks, Josh. Um, Bill, this one to be directed at you, um, specific to the Stark Fire Block wall. Or, uh, does it have a UL rating? So it, um, we have an Intertech rating, uh, which is a certification that aligns with UL. Uh, Intertech did the uh, uh, the fire test and then the uh, fire hose test on our uh, solution. But uh, if you'd like to reach out to me, I'd be happy to give you the. Uh, uh, information on the Intertech uh, certification. Got it. Janet, Bill, I was going to, um, I saw one come in here. Um, you, Bill, you made reference to sort of the use of the walls for isolation. Um, Janet, you may have a perspective on, you know, if these are being used in construction, you know, what, what might have to occur to sort of, um, can they be used for, you know, isolate, how, what procedures or, or things should we do to, uh, use the same walls for isolation. Do you want to address yeah. that? Sure. That's a great question. And I've spent some time thinking about that, as you can imagine, um, with COVID. Uh, before my current position, I was in a hospital in New York City uh, for the first wave of this pandemic. And so that was, that was a real consideration for us. Um, so, yeah, I think that that a way to approach this is to look at your um, emergency management plan and think about uh, whether and how you can integrate some of these walls into your emergency management plan. Um, where would you want them? I think the picture of the emergency department was a great one. Some other areas to be considered might be an ambulatory surgery PACU because a lot of times when you uh, we learned from COVID when you get a big wave of COVID, you're um, you're going to not be doing these elective ambulatory procedures as one of the first things that kind of gets cut to um, to manage the uh, the outbreak and the pandemic. So uh, you might be able to quickly stand up some isolation or separate your emergency department into the the uh, COVID or whatever the the um, infectious disease of the day is in one direction and other people who are still there having their strokes and heart attacks and car accidents and whatnot into another uh, direction. And so you, you should think about number one, what, what would be your strategic use of these walls in that situation and see if you can get enough walls to make that happen. Now you can't do that for your whole hospital, right? But um, thinking about it strategically, and then also using them for construction with in mind and, and in writing a procedure for how you would secure your construction areas otherwise. And I think that we also learned from COVID that uh, nobody's doing, uh, you know, elective construction during a pandemic or an outbreak that's of a big proportion either. So how would you secure the area in some way that would free up the walls that you, you had been using, have a process for making sure that they are cleaned thoroughly and then redeployed. Um, and so it probably can't be done in 15 minutes, but it probably could be done overnight if the need was great enough and, uh, you, and you had the process already in place and staff were trained in how this was gonna work. Thank you. Bill, anything to add there in terms of some of our direct uses in the field? Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, it's it's natural that, you know, a company that's been around six, seven years, um, you know, dealing with um, ICRA, uh, specifically occupied renovation in, in the healthcare space, um, you know, that was a natural transition to have some of our healthcare facilities reaching out to Stark uh, and asking questions and uh, you know, early stages during COVID, the idea was, you know, something as simple as cordoning off a hallway and almost creating an ante room within a hallway so that uh, COVID positive rooms were at the, you know, end of a floor and um, setting up an ante room for the healthcare uh, facility folks to, to um, prep before they went in uh, to the, uh, to that end of the hallway. Um, you know, that we did see an uptick in the number of uh, hospitals and healthcare facilities that were purchasing the panels and then holding on to them, um, you know, as they start to look at, at renovation and, and then, um, you know, also having that stockpile so that they could 
uh, tweak whatever they needed as their uh, influx of, of COVID patients uh, waxed and waned. Thank you. you hey, Paul, quick one for you. Um, you know, again, you spoke about the importance of um, documentation early on. And um, what, um, and I think you shared on the screen sort of uh, one of the documents you use to ensure adherence to things identified during the um, ICRA pre-assessment. Um, can you speak to that again? And a few folks are asking about sort of um, how we might share some of those resources. Um, sure. As um, examples. Yeah. Um, somebody did ask about uh, our, uh, our uh, document that we use. And uh, I believe Jennifer can share yeah. that with all the participants. So just so everybody knows that uh, that, that can be shared, um, the university is happy to educate other people. Um, you know, I, I just in my experience, there's, uh, you know, uh, we always learn when we start a new project that with all of the best of planning, there's still gaps. And uh, um, by having a team approach, you get this institutional knowledge between the infection prevention professionals, the fire safety professionals, construction people, as well as the designers. And they bring that knowledge and experience to the next project. And, uh, you know, so you build this big tool chest of, uh, of experiences that makes all the successive projects more successful. So, um, you know, the, the, a good place to start is with your next project and, uh, you know, bring those teams together. Um, and uh, it certainly will help you in the long run as you build up your old, your old uh, bag of tricks, um, as my old boss used to say. Great, thanks so much, Paul. Uh, for our audience, I think I've seen a sort of the questions sort of slow down here. I do see a few requests about Stark installation videos. Um, just for the audience, those are available on our website under a section called resources. Uh, also, you could reach out to Bill or myself um, at Stark Systems and we'll make sure you can get a, a physical copy. Um, as a reminder, we will make the uh, recording of today's session available uh, with the email you registered for the event, uh, as well as um, any other documentation our panel panelists are willing to share that might reflect um, you know, a starting point and, and, and templates that uh, others could benefit from. So with that, I'd like to thank you once again for attending. Thank you to our panelists, Dr. Janet Haas, Paul Goodman, Josh Bracken and Bill Cooper. Uh, thanks so much for your time, and we'll end there.